This is a, a public hearing, public engagement, and the uh, council members are over here visiting among themselves, uh, but the role of the the role of the council is to hear your views, to hear your thoughts, ideas, reactions, uh, so that uh, they have that in mind when, they, when a decision is made. So with that, we'll turn it over to the city manager uh, for the presentation. Thank you, Mayor Walgast. Um, I'm going to stand behind here primarily because it will help me. It, it will help me take notes as we get into the uh, question and answer period. So uh, some of you were here last evening, and I thought that it went really well. We had a meeting at the library. It lasted a little bit longer than two hours. I thought there was some very good uh, dialogue and engagement, and I really liked at the end there was an opportunity for people to, uh, to meet up with various members of staff with, uh, uh, with the, the, the potential operator. So I will start just by saying that this is a very complex deal. And, it, and any deal, complex or simple, suffers from too long of a duration. So we began the discussions. Are you guys getting a lot of feedback? OK, maybe it's just me. So the uh, discussions started on the deal that is before the council today going back to April of 2014. We're now at the end of April 2015. So it's hard to continue to pull information out and not find issues, discrepancies. You said this, it really means that. And, and I can only say that we have intended from the beginning to be very open and to provide information. and. Uh, uh, we want to continue to do that. So the purpose of today, as Mayor Wolgas stated, is to provide this council who is going to be asked to consider this, uh, this, this uh, project next Tuesday, May 5th, they want to hear what you have to say. And last night, the way that the format worked, and I thought it worked very well, is we had people who signed up to ask questions. We, we, uh, we gave them that chance to ask those questions, and then we opened it up to the stand. Now, I believe there's a list somewhere that I haven't seen yet, but we'll get to that. The, the first thing I'd like to do is, is make a, a brief presentation or have a pre, pre, brief presentation made to you. First, I'll ask Chad Sublet, the city attorney, to talk about the legal aspects of the deal and where we stand today. I'll ask Mr. Gerber, Doug Gerber, the Director of Administration and Financial Services for the city, to talk about this from a financial perspective and what it means to the city. And then I think the highlight of the day is the opportunity for you to uh, meet the proposed operator, the respondent to the RFP, um, his attorney, Wes Carrillo, and Chris Payne, uh, who uh, is operating under a company called Shelby LLC. Uh, which would be the operator for this. So we want to answer your questions. The most important thing about today is to have an opportunity to hear and to ask questions. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Sublette. Good morning. I'm a little taller, so. Um, Thanks for pointing out. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the where we are in terms of the legal aspects and then just kind of do an introduction to this slide and then have Mr. Gerber um, go into more of the financial details of it. Uh, as you are all probably aware, at one point, I believe in October, there was a petition that was circulated and filed uh, to uh, put this to a public vote. The district court ruled that that purported petition was not valid. The appellate court ruled the same thing. Uh, so where we sit right now is that that issue has been what's called certified to the Supreme Court, Kansas Supreme Court. Essentially, they've asked the Kansas Supreme Court to look at it as well. Um, there is no stay in place. What a stay would be is if a court said, city, stop, you can't move forward. At one point, there was a temporary stay put in place by the district court. Um, it was lifted. The Supreme Court has not issued a stay. No other court has issued a stay. So there is nothing preventing the city from putting this before the governing body at this point to make a determination about how they would like to proceed. So that's essentially 
in a nutshell legally where all the court cases and everything sits that you might have read about in the paper. What you have in front of you is a slide that just demonstrates uh, right now what our two options are. Currently, yeah, I don't know, I don't know what I just did. Um, but currently, there's between 8.2 and 10.6 million dollars in star bonds owed by the city uh, from a 2005 issuance. Those are full faith and credit star bonds, meaning the city is responsible for paying um, for those bonds, uh, whether the property is foreclosed on, the property is sold, the property is turned into a field, the city is responsible for those bonds. Uh, over the next 11 years, and I'll let Doug get into the specifics, but the uh, payments on those would be approximately a million dollars, maybe a little more. So that's kind of where we sit. If we don't issue star bonds, we don't do anything, that's the uh, debt situation we're in. The Department of Commerce approached the city uh, about the potential of issuing additional star bonds again. I, I think it was a little over a year ago. Um, what the plan was, was the city would issue $5 million in additional star bonds, and that would, well, it was approximately, it was between 4.8 and $5.5 .5 million in additional star bonds, and that would clear out um, the debt associated with Heartland Park. It would allow the city to purchase the property interest that Jayhawk Racing has in the property. Uh, they have a, what's called a reversionary interest, meaning when an event happens, and in this case, the event is when the star bonds are paid, all the property reverts back to Jayhawk Racing. So that has a value to it. Uh, and that reversionary interest has been in place since 1988 when Heartland Park was run by Lario. So it essentially would allow the city to own the property free and clear and then engage in management and operating agency or um, company to manage the property from that point going forward. Um, in addition to issuing the star bonds, it would allow us to expand the star bond district. If you see the map up here, ye the yellow um, part is what is currently considered the Heartland Park star bond district. And as you can see, it's relatively small. It incorporates just essentially Heartland Park. So any revenue that's generated out of that yellow piece, the city gets the state portion of the sales tax and the city portion of the sales tax to repay the bonds. Under the plan, if we issue the additional $5 million in bonds, as you can see, it extends pretty significantly up to Croy, and the city can capture all of the state sales tax and not only the yellow, but the purple area to address the, um, the eight point, well, it'd be about 15 million, $16 million in debt. And um, in order, in, when we capture those sales tax revenue, it would address the debt. So at the end of the 11 years, there would be um, zero, zero taxpayer dollars owed after the issuance of the star bonds. Um, I probably talked too much about finance stuff, so I'm gonna let Mr. Gerber take over and correct anything that I said that was wrong in terms of the financing. Um, so. Uh, good morning, Doug Gerber, Director of Administration and Financial Services. Um, Chad's always too hard on himself about financial issues. He understands them way better than he gives himself credit for. And he really hit on all of the salient points, but I'll just, I'll make a couple uh, brief remarks and maybe a few clarifying comments and then uh, turn it over to the more interesting part of the day. Uh, as with last night, I want to start with one simple fact, and that fact is that as of right now, no matter what happens, the city owes $10.6 million. From the 2005 and 2006 issuance of both GEO bonds and STAR bonds, that's a fact. That debt service is there. It has to be paid no matter what happens. So with that in mind, the city has worked uh, collaboratively, collaboratively with some groups to, to craft this scenario which is as Chad described, and that is to expand the existing star bond district, thereby capturing some additional state sales tax revenue, such that that additional revenue will be 
sufficient to pay off the debt service, not only for our existing debt, but also for any debt that we might issue going forward. Uh, so as part of the expanded Starbond district, which would include the purple on the map up here, we estimate that there would be approximately, and again, these are just estimates, these are our best guesses, they've been pronounced reasonable by a number of entities, including legislative post audit, but they're, they're just estimates. We're looking out 10 years and trying to do our best to predict the future. We made a very conservative growth assumption of 1% through the district. Uh, and so th with that growth assumption, we estimate that we would uh, capture over the life of the district through 2025, we would capture $16.4 million in state sales tax. That would be supplemented, as we've, as we've discussed with the council before, that would be supplemented by a, um, 1.6 million in, in city sales tax to give us a total collection of uh, $18 million, which would be sufficient to pay the debt service on not only the existing debt, but also any debt we might issue going forward. So with that, with that very brief overview, um, uh, I have the distinct pleasure now of being able to turn the microphone over to uh, Wes Carrillo, and he's going to talk a little bit about um, his excitement about this project and, and do some talking about the potential operator, Chris yeah. Payne. You say you're going to do clarifying comments, but you didn't clarify that uh, Walmart is no longer in that district for our tax purposes. Would you clarify that, please? Uh, you you uh, stated it accurately, Joanne. Uh, Walmart is not; those calculations are not in our in any of our modeling. That, at that, the request that, of the Department of Commerce. That taxes will go directly to the state and not to toward the, the paying the start bonds. That's correct. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Wesley Carrillo. I'm the attorney for Shelby Development uh, LLC, uh, who's here with its, uh, its managing member, Chris Payne. Uh, we just wanted to thank you for the opportunity uh, to allow us to come and speak, and, and I understand you all have a bunch of questions about the Star Bonds project as well as about the future of Heartland Park. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can give you an idea of what uh, we see uh, for the future of Heartland Park Topeka as well as uh, what our plans would be if we are ultimately selected as the operator uh, for the Heartland Park Topeka. And so part of that is an introduction uh, to kind of the team that we've put together. Uh, first off, we want to let you know that one of the main differences as Heartland Park Topeka exists now uh, as it versus what it will exist in the future is that uh, Mr. Payne uh, is not going to be the day-to-day -day operator of the track. He is going to hire somebody uh, who is uh, known around the country to manage national event tracks. Uh, this person, while we can't say his name because he's currently employed, has committed to us uh, that he will come if the opportunity presents itself uh, to join our team. This person is someone who has over uh, 30 years a professional sports motorsports management uh, experience somebody who is experienced in national events hosting national events gaining sponsors for national events uh, and quite frankly his experience is second to none in the in the industry uh, he has experience with the national hot rod association as well as the international hot rod association and he uh, become he comes highly recommended uh, you know as as we want you to know is that this is a person that's going to be doing the day-to-day -day operations of the track itself the the gaining sponsors the the hosting of the national events those types of things are going to be part of our staff uh, mr. Payne's uh, professional development is going to be the development of the track and the area outside of the track uh, he he will focus on gaining uh, new businesses to attract to the tracked area building uh, properties and buildings, commercial warehouse buildings, to get businesses uh, to come to that area. And we'll talk a little bit more about what, um, what our actual more specific goals are for the area uh, here in a few minutes. But, you know, I wanted to give you a little background on Mr. Payne. Mr. Payne is, is, is very experienced and has been very successful uh, in focusing on redevelopment and revitalization of areas uh, in, in the Kansas City area specifically, uh, in areas that have generally been either neglected or unattractive uh, to investors, uh, and has turned those areas into prime locations. Uh, areas that once didn't attract many businesses are now 
contracting uh, national chains uh, to open up new stores in that area as well as become tenants in those buildings. So uh, he has a lot of experience in development and redevelopment of commercial property, which is one thing that Heartland Park hasn't seen a lot of and, well, quite frankly, hasn't seen hardly any uh, actual development out there of the ground that's outside of the racetrack. And that's something that's important. And that's why uh, we've kind of have a, a, this side, uh, a two-part approach to this. One is having somebody who is the best in the nation at operating racetracks, and then somebody who is very, very good and very successful at developing the, the commercial areas. Uh, and, and to assist Mr. Payne in uh, the development side is we're going to have Bill Moss of Block and Company in, in Kansas City, who's going to be a support staff and someone to assist us in that development process. Mr. Moss is experienced in uh, both gaining development type of properties, selling, uh, reselling those types of properties, and assisting in the actual development of those properties. But one of his other big assets is that he's got the ability to attract national tenants, chain type tenants, and potential sponsors for the racetrack. And that's going to be important if we look at the future of Heartland Park as being more than just a racetrack and going back to what its initial intentions were is that that empty ground out there isn't used for soybean fields or hay fields, but rather to be something that is going to generate revenue and something that's actually going to attract businesses to come out there and develop that area rather than have it see uh, be kind of an empty space um, you know one of the one of the major issues and one of the hurdles we see is that the racetrack as far as we know it uh, and keep in mind we haven't had the opportunity or the ability to actually set foot on the racetrack and understand exactly what the racetrack needs but we do understand that there are things like deferred maintenance that are going to be necessary in the racetrack uh, such as you know repairs to the bleachers repairs to the grandstands repairs to the tracks uh, you know, maintenance on the road course, a lot of different items that are that are going to be time extensive as well as expensive uh, to actually go out and get the track to where, quite frankly, it should have been at this stage in the game and where they need to be to attract racers and to keep the uh, the track at, at the level that it needs to be to continue to attract NHRA races not just NHRA races that are the national event, but points races uh, and other racers, the Friday, Saturday night type folks uh, that are also going to come out there and spend money at the track as well as in the surrounding area. And so there are a lot of things that need to be done to the track that, that we anticipate need to be done to the track. And based on our um, knowledge, limited knowledge of the track, haven't been done or haven't been taken care of in, in quite a, a while. And those repairs are going to be necessary. Um, you know, in, in keeping the track in good repair and keeping the other tracks in good repair are necessary not only between the relationship of NHRA and Heartland Park Topeka, but also uh, for the relationships with other sporting club uh, or sports car or motorsports types industries because they may want to utilize the track for something other than, than just racing. Uh, we understand that the dirt track is going to need some, some improvements, uh, some modifications to it. Uh, geographical modifications maybe uh, the road course needs a significant uh, rebuild and repair uh, and and as well as the the areas around the the facilities I mean we're talking about restrooms that are old we're talking about suites that need updated just a lot of different things that need to spruce up Heartland Park Topeka things that haven't been done uh, over the period of time uh, that just need they need, you need to have those things to attract the big national sponsors, to attract the local sponsors, and to attract the racers uh, and, and the organizations holding those and sanctioning those races. So those are the things that, that, that we see that, that needs to happen at the racetrack, as well as some additions that need to be made at the racetrack. And some of those additions include uh, storage, uh, places where people can actually keep their vehicles, keep their trailers, or... Um, actually work on them and have a place to utilize an area during the course of the race or during the course of a race weekend. Uh, the other part of this, and, and we think that has been 
the racetrack has been util utilized. It's, it's been underutilized, and, and it's clearly not performing at where it can perform. And that's where we think our staff will be able to get it back up to where it needs to be, continue to attract the national events and other events, and keep this racetrack going strong. But the other side of it is also the development area, the area that you go out there now, and it, it's green grass. It looks pretty, but it's not doing anything for the citizens. It's not doing anything for the community. It's sitting essentially empty. And that's where uh, we'd like to see numerous things go up. And some of those things are like a convenience store. And, and last night when sitting with some of the citizens and talking with them, if you look at that area, one thing you have all the Mars employees, you have the Forbes, or the, the Forbes Air Force Base, you have a lot of people who are utilizing that area or collected in that area. And the closest convenience store is about a mile away. Uh, so that's one thing that we think would be very important out there is to utilize a convenience store, uh, some type of conference center or hotel, as well as a restaurant. Uh, and then the storage areas for, for racing, but also the commercial development uh, that will attract businesses. Businesses that are either going to be in the motorsports industry, uh, which is important for them to have access to a variety of different tracks, not just the drag strip, not just the road course, uh, the dirt track, all other types of, of tracks. So they can do several things. Number one, manufacture their equipment there. Number two, test their equipment there. Right now, if, if, if I'm a, a motorsports R&D company and I'm trying to develop something, I now have to move that project out completely out to the racetrack in order to test that project and then completely move everything back. That's not convenient for them. And we think that if there are warehouse facilities out there and there are locations where they can utilize that, that they will come and they, and they will benefit from the track. They'll produce the revenue that, that needs, needs to be out there as well as develop jobs. Um, you know, from a raceway plan and, and kind of a future is, is we want to we want to start rebuilding relationships. Uh, we want to rebuild the relationship between the operator and the citizens of Topeka, the operator in the city, uh, NHRA, IHRA, all of these different organizations, the Sports Car Club of America, uh, and start rebuilding those relationships to, to attract more events out there, more, um, more racers out there, more spectators out there. And quite frankly, all of that results in hopefully more spending out there, which then allows that little yellow area to become more productive than it has been in the past. Uh, we want to get back to um, not just a national event being the main event, but having it a much more productive and an active track out there. And, and, and as one individual described last night, I mean, Heartland Park Topeka is one of a kind, and it's one of a kind because it uh, provides us with all kinds of different opportunities for racers, for R&D. It's got everything you could possibly want in one single area. And it's something that that, that uh, diversity of racing hasn't necessarily been utilized to this point in time. Uh, but we also want to, uh, to, to get this track to the point where the city of Topeka once again can come back and say, hey, we've got Heartland Park Topeka and it's everything we've ever imagined it to be. Uh, now, we want to make sure that everyone understands that that's not going to happen overnight. Uh, this problem, the, 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 the slowing down of the track didn't happen overnight. The real rebuilding and the revitalization of it's not going to happen overnight. But we believe that we've put together the team who has the expertise and the ability and the knowledge to make the racetrack what it needs to be, as well as develop that area uh, around the racetrack. And, you know, Mr. Payne and Shelby Development have put together a ton uh, of different resources, put together a great team, and as well as, well as put a lot of effort into getting to this, to, to this point and getting to the point where you know, we can potentially take over the operation of the track. And that's what, what we want to do. And, and, and one of the other reasons that we wanted to get up here is to, to tell you, and you know, maybe preemptively answer some of your questions. And one of the biggest questions that we've seen uh, in the course of following this topic and reading the newspaper articles and reading your all's comments is, uh, you know, what's, what's the deal going to be? What's the term of, of this agreement going to look like? And uh, understandably, we can't give you every detail, number one, because we don't have uh, an agreement. We're still in the negotiation phase. It's still kind of a fluid thing, but there are things that we can tell you that will be absolutely certain. And those things are it's a, that it's going to be a large uh, 
upfront payment uh, at the beginning. As soon as we sign an operator agreement, there's going to be a significant payment there. Uh, we're also going to invest at least $5 million into the racetrack and the development area. Uh, that's not going to be $5 million of citizens' funds. That's going to be $5 million of Shelby Development Funds and Mr. Payne's funds. These are their investment, not city dollars. Uh, that's the money that, 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 that Shelby Development is going to put forward towards the development of the property. Um, the other agreement that we'll have is that we're going to develop the surrounding area. It's not going to sit there. The $5 million isn't just going to go to repair the track and get it racing. We're talking about money going to actually develop the surrounding area. Uh, also, maintaining the track, uh, keeping the maintenance up on the track, and maintaining and, de and, and developing the property. Uh, the agreement will also have specific performance metrics uh, that are, will be built into it. Uh, and the other part of it, too, is that uh, Mr. Payne and, and Shelby Development are willing to, to expose for, for several years, uh, three to four years uh, initially, the financials of the track and, and publish those using a third-party local CPA firm here in Topeka. And so that way, the citizens of, of Topeka will get to see what the gross revenue is, what, what the income expenses are, how much money is being spent on development. And so it's an open book for you all. And you actually get to, to, to look at what that is doing, what kind of tax revenue it is generating in that little yellow area, something that, uh, that we believe that you haven't had the opportunity to do. So, you know, once again, I just want to thank you all for your time. We're, just like last night, we'll stick around after this and hope to get to chat and meet a lot of you um, and, and have the opportunity to answer your specific questions questions uh, if, if those questions aren't, aren't answered in kind of the exchange coming up. I look forward to meeting you all and really appreciate everyone coming out here. I said this last night, you know, I come from a small town in southeast Kansas and, and you know, last night we had a ton of people at the town hall meeting. That's how public government is supposed to work. This is the way that process is supposed to exchange. I was a political science major in college. So, um, you know, this is the way it's supposed to work and I think that this is a great opportunity and quite frankly really appreciate uh, the citizens' participation in this good, bad, indifferent, in favor, not in favor, all of these things are great, and it's great that you all have the commitment to your community to come out here and uh, attend meetings like this. And I guess I'll turn it back over to Jim, okay, or to Mayor. Okay. There's no mic right, but I, I failed to introduce I failed to introduce uh, the council members, and I want you to know uh, these people work, you know, this job isn't, their job isn't a full-time job, so I appreciate their taking the time, as you know you do, for being here today. Jeffrey Cohen is the new council member from um, District 8, um, Deputy Mayor um, Karen Hiller. From, de from District 1, new council member Brendan Jensen from District 6, uh, Councilman Del Isla from District 5. So good good group. This is half, yeah, half the council is here, so we're glad that they could be here and participate. Good, thank you. The uh, process is gonna be, all, people have signed up, and if you said, yes, I want to speak, I'm going to uh, offer you the mic. Uh, the, the goal is to, you can make a comment, support, not support, you can ask a question to the degree that we can answer the question, we will. Um, so, the first person that signed up and wishes to speak uh, is Larry Hinton. Thank you, and um, thank you f for the opportunity to hear the information again on Heartland Park and the alternatives that are available. And I mean, to me, the, the yes or no question on this seems pretty clear on what happens if there's not this new star bonds. I mean, we, we are going to have to pay for it in, in some way, and we've got a partially developed parcel of land out there with, with potential. Um, I, I, I guess one of the qu questions or just comments for potential operators is to look at examples around the country where there's tracks, race tracks that have been virtually abandoned and then rebuilt and become centers of development 
Summit Point, West Virginia was recently profiled on a show on TV. You know, Summit Point is in the middle of nowhere, frankly, uh, on the edge of West Virginia, and the, the, just off of the West Ed's edge of Virginia. They're doing incredible things out there. Uh, Washington, D.C. would be the biggest city, and it's, it's a long haul from D.C. to Summit Point, West Virginia, but they're booming. Uh, Virginia International Raceway, also in Virginia, was an abandoned road race track for decades. It's booming. It has all kinds of international racing and other, and the point is other events that are there all the time supporting the track. And also we can look at uh, a new development, which is uh, the Circuit of the Americas in Austin, Texas. You know, we don't have the close population that Austin has, but the venue, they're doing so much with it besides just racing that is generating revenue. And, you know, Austin, Texas is, is a center of a lot of things, including it's known for music. Well, they've made Circuit of Americas also a major music venue, and it's not hurting the, the other music in Austin. It's just increasing Austin being seen as a center for that. So there's so much that can be done by looking at what, what else there is out there and what, what developers done, have done across the country to projects. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. The next person, uh, I, I'm not sure I'm gonna read this right. Mary what do you call? Mary Jo. Mary, Mary Jo? <laughs> Mary Jo. Right All right, that that was reflecting my my Arizona. That was reflecting my Arizona upbringing, where. <laughs> All right, Mary Jo. Okay. Well. Um, anyway, what I I keep seeing um, if there's no activity in the park, loss of 53 million. Um, well, with Brown back as governor, if we keep get, getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, I just. I'm not sure about, I mean, what else can star bonds be used for? Let me read um, a letter that I wrote, and maybe you'll understand me more of my opinion. But it was in the editorial page, and I'm one that voices my opinion a lot, uh, maybe too much, I don't know. But anyway, our state government keeps sinking deeper in debt, thanks to Governor Sam Brownback. There is an old saying, two things are, are certain in life, death and taxes. That's true, but if you live in Kansas while Brownback is governor, put taxes before death. Unless, however, you are upper class and need not worry about taxes. Here in Topeka, the fate of Heartland Park Topeka, what or who should take over the racetrack has been an issue for some time. I keep on hearing the issue will be decided at the next Topeka Council meeting or in court, but then it isn't because for some reason, it always is found, is there some reason to defer or keep prolonging it? I have a feeling everyone and everything will be moved to another planet before this issue is resolved. Anyway, there is one positive development from the recent municipal election. The mayor will be able to have a vote on issues in city council meetings now. Uh, before he could only, now maybe we can pass the ribbon cutting responsibility to Brownback. It seems so easy, you would think there is no way he can mess it up, but I wouldn't count on it. But anyway, what I'm trying to uh, get across is how, uh, what else can the bonds be used for and will this really generate money in Topeka, they keep opening uh, the airport and planes keep, uh, will, and then will, they'll say, well, we'll have it for a year, but then it shuts down because it doesn't make any money. We don't have enough money. And then there are schools uh, that, that they're rated low in testing. I think maybe if you gave Brownback a math test, he'd fail it. Uh, uh, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't, uh, he, uh, I definitely don't think he would pass math. Maybe you should teach, make, test him in the math. But anyway, I just think uh, we keep getting deeper and deeper, and Kansas is, is a joke now. Uh, but anyway, that was just my opinion, and I think we can use the money for better things. Um, but um, like I said, um, 
Mayor Larry will guess. Oh, I'm also on the American Disability Association, but Larry, I'm glad you'll finally get to do more than cut yellow ribbons. Uh, you'll be able to speak your voice and give that, let Brownback cut yellow ribbons. I mean, it doesn't deal with money, but I'm sure there's something that he would screw up. But anyway, so here. Thank you, Mary Jo. The next person is Lewis Dalton or Doc Ten? Dalton? Yes. Thank you. I, I like this slide. Uh, by analogy, I think it says that if I buy a house for a million dollars and then I borrow another $500,000, then I don't owe anything. So we're going to, we already borrowed $10 million. $10.6 million. We're going to borrow another $5 million, and then we don't owe anything. Somehow, I think we probably still owe $15 million. Maybe what it's saying is that you're hoping somebody else is going to pay for it. But I'm, I'm pretty sure we still owe $15 million if we borrow it. But we don't want to own Heartland Park again if, if we don't own it now. I mean, we did buy it back in 1988, according to uh, what the city said. I don't know, it, it, their slide didn't say when we sold it. But apparently, we don't own it now, and we want to buy it again. Um, Maybe we lost it in the bankruptcy in 2002. I'm not sure. The slide wasn't real clear. Uh, Lario was operating it, and he withdrew, and he filed bankruptcy. Maybe we lost it in that bankruptcy. But then Jayhawk started managing it, so somebody had to own it at that point in time. But Jayhawk doesn't own it now. So I'm not clear about that. Um, but we don't want to own it. Uh, the city doesn't need to own a racetrack. We own a convention center uh, that needs a lot of work. Um, there are a lot of other things that we need to put that money towards in the city. Uh, I'm sure all of your roads are in great condition, but there's, there's other folks who would like to see the roads improved. Um, maybe the convention center uh, that needs work uh, could be improved. Um, if someone can't make Heartland Park run as a business, then we should let it go back to grasslands. Uh, and I don't want my property tax raised. That's what they say we're going to have to do to pay that uh, $10.6 million if we don't borrow another $5 million on top of it. Um, okay, go ahead and raise my property taxes to pay for the city council's, the former city council's prior mistakes, but don't compound the error. Don't kick the can down the road for our kids to have to pay a bigger tax bill. It's not true that if we issue star bonds, taxpayers will owe nothing. They still owe the money. And uh, the, the guy who, who, the lawyer, we, we love lawyers. We've heard from the lawyers and the accountants today. The lawyer says that it's a money pit. You saw the movie, The Money Pit. Uh, it was a house that was just in terrible shape. Well, apparently, Heartland Park is in terrible shape. It needs repairs to bleachers. It needs a repair to the track. It needs other maintenance. A lot of things need done. The tur dirt track needs to be redone. Um, and who did they come to when the track needed to be resurfaced in 2007? The city had to cough up three quarters of a million dollars to redo the track. The owners have to pay those things. Now, the lawyer says they're going to put $5 million into it right up front. 
And of course, we trust lawyers, but we don't have it in writing because they're still in negotiations. But we can trust them. Surely we can trust them. But I stand opposed to the issuance of bonds for Heartland Park. So, um, Ms. Dalton, thank you. And, and I want to recognize that what you did is important. And the fact that you were willing to take time off from your regular activities, come here and speak of that. But I think it's also important to respond to things that are incorrect. And I want to say very clearly, and I said it again last night, the city has never said that if this deal doesn't go forward that we are going to raise your property taxes. I think it is a position that people have jumped to. There's no threat here. There's no disingenuity on the part of the city to make threats. We have said that we evaluated a challenging financial decision based on decisions that were made in 2005 and 2006 and that we believed that putting together this particular response was the best financial response to the city in the long-term interest. But we said repeatedly, and I've told my body, I like to refer to them as my bosses, that if this deal doesn't go forward, the world's not going to end. Through our, inter through our existing budget, we will find the way to address this. And in our budget plan that we built this year, we built it with the idea that we would be paying the, the current debt service. But everybody needs to remember that this is the response to multiple decisions that have been made in the past. And we are addressing that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, Michelle de la Isla, City Council, District 5. Um, the behemoth here is in my district, so I feel extremely responsible for what's happening right now. And I am really looking forward to finding a, the best possible solution that we can to this issue. I just wanted to address something that Mr. Dalton just said. I really love your analogy of a house. And um, one of the books that I'm reading right now is Rich, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I don't know if you're familiar with that book. And it talks about how, as consumers, the number one mistake that we make is that we consider our home our number one investment and our biggest cash investment. And I think that what we're failing to see here is that I understand absolutely, we're not saying that the debt is not going to be there. What is being said is that, and that's what I'm saying, I'm not saying that the debt is not going to be there. What we're saying is that the tax dollars, to, the tax dollars that are going to be generated through that investment are going to then produce more money. So it's the same strategy of investing in something that is going to provide dividends that will cover that debt. And I know that it's, it's, it's difficult. There's, there's a lack of trust in our community. And I know how complicated this is because I tell you what, I find myself up at night sometimes trying to just really tie every single end of this deal. And it is complicated. I mean, we are, we are taking it so seriously that you're seeing people that were here last night coming in again just to see if we get one more nugget of knowledge. But I think that the bottom line and what we're missing is the fact that no matter what happens, the track, Mr. Colson said it very accurately, we can't, he can't talk about taxes because it is not his decision to raise taxes. It is the body's decision to raise taxes. And the body has not talked about that. We're trying to evaluate what the alternatives are for us to help constituents not have to pay for those funds out of those property taxes if that is the alternative that we are faced with. I understand the lack of trust. We have talked a lot of times about how things should have gone and where they, could have gone, they, they, where they should have gone. However, the only thing that I implore everybody is that take a look at the efforts that we are going through to make sure that everybody understands what's happening. Mr. Payne is here. We're all sitting here. We're trying to come up with the best solution. It's not, it's not easy. But we're really trying to operate from the best possible stance that we can. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, the next uh, person is Leo Hafner.
Uh, thank you. Uh, I was here last night, and I'll probably make some of the same comments today. There's, there's been a lot going on and things going through my head. Uh, I just want to kind of identify myself. I Previously um, in my life, I was the uh, deputy state auditor here for the last 10 years before I retired. So I know about as much about star bonds as anybody in this room, I think. I was involved in a review of star bonds at the Kansas Speedway and all that development that was up there. So I know pretty much about what's going on there. In my opinion, the approach that we're taking with this thing is unethical. And the star bond law is being stretched to the limit to be used in a way that it should never have been used. But the city has been able to get the state to cooperate with that. They've gotten the Secretary of Commerce, who has a lot of power in this, there's no doubt about that. They, they can decide what can happen and what can't happen. But that law was designed to generate new commerce, and the, new, the sales tax from the new commerce was supposed to pay off the bonds. What's happening in this situation is we're taking existing commerce. We've got the Ed Bozarth dealership out there that has been there long before Heartland Park was ever there, and people are paying, we're paying sales tax there, and we're cabbaging that, and we're substituting that and paying the bonds with that kind of money from all those businesses that are out there. And so this, in my opinion, is unethical because what we're doing is we're shifting the burden of Topeka's bad decisions in the past onto the taxpayers of the state of Kansas. And I just think that's unethical, number one, so I want to say that. Number two, we've talked a lot about trust and about the city's interest in accuracy and things like that. Well, I want to point out that there are three documents here today that are the core of the city's presentation. We've got the map over here, we've got the slide there, and we've got the handout here. Okay, as Joanne Peevler pointed out last night, and, and as did Chris Emming, who did the petition, and others, that, that the map is inaccurate because it shows Walmart in the district, and they're saying it's not in the district. I will point out, as I did last night, that this particular figure that we didn't have a handout last night, where it shows if we issue the bonds, Topeka taxpayers pay zero. That is not true. Because as they have said, if the bonds are issued, the sales tax that comes in there is 16.4 million from the state and 1.6 million of local sales tax. That 1.6 million and the, six, the 16 million used to go to the state, and the 1.6 million came into the city, into the city coffers, and it was used for city things. Okay, now we're gonna take that 1.6 million, it's no longer gonna be in the city coffers, it's gonna go to pay off the bonds. And so, we have to make that up somehow. And how is that gonna get made up? That's gonna get made up through property taxes. Either that or they're gonna to have to cut some services. I mean, th those are the only choices there. The other thing that they keep saying is, this is the best possible solution. I don't believe it is. We've got a situation where we have already passed a half cent sales tax, which earmarks $5 million a year for economic development. We keep being told that Heartland Park is a big economic asset to the city. Okay, so we could take $1 million a year for 10 years and pay off these bonds. No new bonds have to be issued. No property tax has to be raised. No bailout needs to occur for Mr. Irwin and Core First Bank. And the whole problem is solved. So given that that money's already earmarked for economic development, why do we not use it for economic development? And I think uh, we've had some analogies with you know, a house, and, and we're saying, trust us, even though we put up inaccurate information, trust us. This is like a realtor trying to sell you a house and saying you can't look at the house. Because we don't know what the agreements are yet, we don't know what we've agreed to with the NHRA. We, we know that the past agreement that, that we had with NHRA had a $1.8 million profit guarantee on it, and it also had some guarantees of how much money the city was gonna spend on advertising Heartland Park, which were unknown to people generally until 
I started reading the thing and raised issues about that. It was on the city's website, and the minute I started raising issues, that came off the website. And we're hiding behind what we're saying is a confidentiality clause here. Well, people like these public-private partnerships, but they don't understand the public part of it. If the public's involved and you're spending the public's money on things, the public has a right to know what the terms of the agreement are and what you're spending the money on. And I think with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Mr. Hafner. I'm going to uh, ask Mr. Sublette to step forward and address some of the, the issues that you raised, especially as it, as it has to do with the legislative post audit. I was glad that the uh, legislative post audit was brought up because I think it was a very valuable tool in this process. That I believe it was the end of January, the beginning of February, um, the legislative post audit committee uh, did an unprecedented audit of this project. That as the name would suggest, post audit, typically they audit projects after they're done, but they wanted to look at this project before it was even um, started, which for us, we were very happy with because anytime we can get somebody to audit our projects for free, um, we'll, we will take that. And they looked at, there was a scope of work that they looked at. They looked at eight different factors in the city's proposal. And anybody that's familiar with audits, um, you know, they weren't going in there just to rubber stamp this and say, you guys did a great job. They looked at hundreds of pages of documents. I sat with the auditors for hours. The city manager met with the auditors, our entire team. We made all of our documents available to them. We made ourselves available to them. Um, we opened everything to them to the point that in the last council meeting, we referred to a letter that we got from legislative post audit that referenced how cooperative and how open the city was in working with them. So in all eight, of the areas they looked at. They found that the city's proposal not only met the legal requirements of the Starbond Financing Act, they found that, that all of the financial um, assumptions made by the city were reasonable. That's not anybody that was hired by the city. That's not anybody that was hired by Core First Bank. That's not anybody that was hired by Jayhawk Racing. And that's not anybody that was hired by somebody that may um, operate this facility in the future. It's an independent legislative body. Um, I'm not going to read verbatim all eight of the findings that they made, but I think the ones that have been talked about that are maybe I'd like to highlight is, is the current proposal to retain Harlem Park rather than to develop or expand, is that allowed under the Starbond Financing Act? And their conclusion was that it was, that it wasn't allowable, uh, something that you could do under the Starbond Financing Act. The economic impact of the current proposal, they looked at, there have been several economic impact studies out there, everything from $45 million a year to $160 million a year. Uh, what, what the legislative post auditors um, found was that they believed it was $53 million. Essentially what they did is they took that $160 million study and said, that study is based on $1 being spent three times. I spend a dollar here, then it gets respent, then it gets respent. So they cut that in third and said that the economic impact um, was essentially a third of that. That's $53 million annually generated um, by Harlem Park. Um, and then the financial solvency, we just talked about that. Uh, the current proposal must demonstrate that it will generate enough sales tax increment revenue to retire the star bonds. So when we talk about the zero number over here, that's what they're looking at. Does the city's plan generate over the next 11 years enough sales tax money to satisfy the bond issuance? And what they specifically said, because I think this is important, um, the current proposal includes an analysis of the expanded star bond district's ability to pay off bond debt, which appears to meet the requirements of the law. We reviewed the city's financial analysis and found that the city's calculations and assumptions about a 1% annual growth rate were reasonable. 
We also found that the recent increases in sales tax rates would account for 8% or about $4 million of the sales tax revenues generated by the expanding district. Again, an independent auditor um, by the state found that our projections were reasonable. So just in terms of addressing um, legislative post audit and their findings, I don't think it's fair to just throw those away. I think it's important. There was a lot of time put into it by the state, a lot of time put into it by the city, um, and they found that we met the expectations on all eight of their um, scope of work that they looked at. I have to make a reply to that because I have the report here, and the things that you don't say is page nine of the report. They say, it's not clear that the legislature envisioned using the bonds to save an existing attraction. They're saying they're not necessarily sure that this is a proper use of, of these, these things. Now, they don't come out and say that because, because actually, as, as we've said, the, the Secretary of Commerce has a lot of leeway here, and, and he's able to do what he can. I'll also point out that they made recommendations here. And if everything's OK, why do you make recommendations to fix, fix things? Because one of the things they objected to was this economic impact study, which said the economic impact of Heartland Park was $160 million a year, which is totally inflated. They, they acknowledged that. They acknowledged that it was, it was done by Mr. Irwin's people, paid people, so it was not independent, and they recommended that the legislature take that function away from the cities so that they don't abuse it and put that with the state so that they can hire some independent people. So in, in terms of compliance, is the compliance that we have a piece of paper in the file that is an economic study, or do we think that the legislature put those requirements to have that economic study in the law to have good, accurate information on which to make decisions? I believe the reason that's in the law is to have good information, not to have a bogus piece of paper in the file. And so, you know, if you're making recommendations, everything ain't okay. Can I say something? I, I would prefer to that we followed our process. Uh, I, I don't, please go ahead and say something. Um, what I might compare this to is those uh, maybe societies or, or uh, magazines or something where you get this advertisement saying if you give this so much money to the society, well then well, we will give you a free umbrella. Well the umbrella isn't free unless you give the money, unless you uh, give so much money, just like I get train magazines, I'm, I'm, my email is train crazy, but anyway, they, they call me and say, well, we'll give you this free DVD train, and I say, wait, let me guess, you're gonna tell me it's free, but if I keep it for a month and, and I want it, then I have to mail you money, don't I? Otherwise, I have to mail it back. Well, then it's not free, is it? And when they see that I'm onto this, they usually don't call me back and they usually hang up, but um, I might compare this to Yep, you really have to listen carefully to how things are being said. But. Okay. I, I want to remind people that reasonable people can disagree, and we want to show everybody respect. Yeah. And Mary Jo, you certainly have the floor, and please continue. Please, uh, please put I, that aside. Let's. Well, I, like I said, I just think you have to listen real carefully to how things are said like like they like they said well we'll mail we'll you this is absolutely free but wait if i want to keep it i have to and watch it then i have to mail you money for it so it's not free or uh or those advertisements in the in that you get all the time well wait if you if you if, if you order one then you'll get another one absolutely free so call this number five 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 one two one two and if i call now and then if and then if you if, if you decide to mail these back well you still get this free gift and you get to, you get to keep it so it's just or so you just have to listen closely to what is being said that's and and thank you. And you do, you do have to listen closely, not because people are trying to lie to you. Uh, Mary Jo, I'm speaking now, thank you. You have to listen closely, not because people are lying to you or trying to pull the wool over your eyes. You have to listen closely because it's complex and there are a lot of details here. So thank you very much uh, for those comments. I'm going to ask Mr. John McFarland. Uh, he signed up for next comments.
my, my comments will be fairly brief. My concern is with this concept of the star bonds. Uh, this is a sales tax that all people in the state of Kansas pay. I pay. And that sales tax was designed for the state expense to the schools and to run state business. And as you know, just a few blocks west of here, they're trying to figure out where all their money's gone and how to recoup some of that money and what to do about this. Well, the concept of star bonds is we're going to take some of that state money, we're gonna bring it back and put it in Heartland Park in Topeka. So it's not available to the people of Kansas. So there's boards of education and school people out there saying, what can we cut? Because we're not getting our state money. Now, I grant it's a small part of it, but it's still a concept. We're taking state money and funneling it into a narrow project in Topeka. My other comment is, I appreciate the gentleman's thoughts of the plans for uh, Harlan Park. I guess my question is, how much dialogue have you had with Go Topeka and some of these organizations that have been working on promoting can uh, Topeka over the years? Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. I, I, and, and this isn't a rebuttal opportunity. I just want to say that the state made their decision because they believed it was in the state's best interest from the fact that, that let's just take the $53 million that that generates revenue that wouldn't be there otherwise. So the, the, the state did make a determination that they, that they felt that there was value to them. But your comments are valid, and we understand them. Thank you. Rick Taylor. Still here? There you are. Is it on? Yes. Thank you. It works. <laughs> no, I'll be brief. I just, there have been so much discussion, uh, so much work done over the last two years on this project. The city uh, staff has done an exemplary job, given the, all the <laughs> different facets of this wonderful subject. But it gets down to Tuesday, you're going to take a vote. I hope the vote is based on a business decision and not a popularity contest. That's it. Thank you, Rick. Uh, the last person that I have signed up is Chuck Hanna. Afternoon, everybody. I'd like to say that I'm excited, especially listening to the gentleman from Shelby, their proposals. The first thing I want to say is Heartland Park, the access to get to Ar Heartland Park is just second to none. Uh, interstate highways, this and that. Marketing has been the problem. It hasn't been marketed correctly. The gentlemen that have spoke, they said this is the thing that's going to make it work, and I truly believe that. The other thing is The venues that can be utilized out there besides racing. We have all mentioned racing, but on the other hand, concerts, you have an opportunity of utilizing that property for other things. And I, another idea that I'm going to mention is that it would make a perfect place for the military or law enforcement for defensive driving during the week in training and things of this nature, another idea. It takes money to make money. That's what makes it work. That, I wish the best for all. And I appreciate all the comments and listening to, to everybody in here. And I thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Mr. Hanna. Uh, at that point, that concludes the people who said they wanted to speak. I would like to make it available for those additional. Could you please just state your name so people know who's speaking and then proceed? My name is LJ Polly. I live in uh, the Elmhurst neighborhood in central Topeka, District 6. And I have a question. Uh, do you think it's feasible to get the uh, operating agreement done by Tuesday? Wow. Well, 
I'll look at all the attorneys and they'll just shake their head no before I look. What we've worked on so far is the letter of intent, but to have, the, to have an agreement which provides all the protections to both parties, and I mean especially the city, I think would take longer than that to negotiate it. One of the council people, I think, has made a public statement that she will vote no if that's not in front of her. Is that your understanding? I did hear that. Well, I support the project, and that causes me great concern, so I hope you all can get high behind and get it done. Thank you very much, sir. And I do want to, LJ is very, uh, very active in, a, in, in the community, and I appreciate his continuing efforts. So at this point, yes, sir. I'm J.R. Campbell. I've lived in this city since 1966. I take exception to the issue star bonds to pick a taxpayer's O zero. You sell bonds, somebody's got to pay it back. It's coming back from the sales tax. Who pays the sales tax? We the people. Next question. Why was this not available last night? I don't believe it was ready by last night. Oh, it was, it didn't get handed out. Well, whenever I came in and sat down, I didn't see anything like this last night. Okay. The other thing, I don't want anybody going away saying I didn't change clothes or shower. The picture that's in the paper today is of me in a large square blue shirt, and this is a small square blue shirt. Well, we actually were talking about that a little bit, so... So th thank you very much for those comments. So I, anybody else? Uh, Deputy Mayor, well, wait a minute. I'm gonna defer out here. Uh, well, I'm Sarah Anderson. I live in Southwest Topeka, and uh, I also want to thank everyone for speaking, no matter where you come from, what's your opinion. My, um, my goal in being here today is that I just want the best for Topeka, whatever that is. It doesn't really, you know, at the end of the day, I'm interested in us progressing, whatever that would be. I don't quite understand it all. I, the analogy I might get is that I... Um, went by White Lakes Mall the other day. I was going to um, Walgreens. And I felt so sad looking at that place because I remember when White Lakes was built and how excited I was. And it was wonderful. And there's just that little part of me that uh, I think, oh gosh, I hope if we decide on this, it, it won't be a White Lakes Mall. It will really be something that's good. And, and effective. But one question I have is what are star bonds? I just don't know what that stands for. <laughs> I'm going to, okay, so just so everybody doesn't shoot themselves in here, uh -huh. I'm going to have the city attorney talk to you okay, so he can explain it in greater yeah, detail. Yeah, really, but, but S-T-A-R, what does that mean? And then I wanted to just ask, because I was at um, um, Topeka High's um, meeting the other night, you know, the, the, the trouble the districts are having with finances for education, and gosh, that's a concern for all of us, and I just appreciated the meeting there, but could, just, I just, for my own information, for everyone else here, could star bonds have been used to help in education? I mean, are we taking that away from something else, or would they not even be allowed to be used for education? So those are the questions that I have. But again, I reiterate, I just really want the best for Topeka, whatever that would be. And I would hope that whatever's done could be in coordinated with Go Topeka and other places so they could have input like we've had today. Thank you very much. So to, and, and Mr. Sublette or Mr. Gerber certainly will be available to, to answer whatever questions you have. I'm not trying to be flippant ab about that response. I, but I, I loved what you said. You want what's best for Topeka. And I guarantee you that no matter what this body does, and talk about a difficult decision where you need to weigh a lot of factors, that is a decision that they will, that they will have. But we will whether the star bond issue um, 
the expansion of the district occurs or does not occur, we will do what's in the best interest of Topeka. And that means what's in the best interest of Topekans. So if, if there is, if the district is not expanded, we'll continue to work for the best of, of the community. And the, 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 the sad thing about this is it's not just Heartland Park. I mean, there's a lot of issues that we need to continue to deal with. So uh, this body, is is really one of the best i'll say the best city council that i've had a chance to work with in my career because they do work hard at understanding and being engaged so is there anybody else if not i'd like to just make the comment that we will all be around here if you want to meet chris personally he's he's uh he's he's quite engaging uh, I don't think he's much, of, I don't think he likes public speaking very much, but uh, um, you'll have an opportunity to meet him. So if uh, do that, I know the elected officials want to hear more. I, and I also know that some people don't feel so comfortable getting up and talking in front of crowds. So that being the case, we will, Mayor, any comments, any thoughts? Any council members want to make any sort of comments? Deputy Mayor, I remember you. <laughs> Well, I just want to, um, I want to thank everyone for coming, and I, I want to thank Mr. Payne and, and Wes, uh, Carrillo, Carrillo. <laughs> Mr. Payne and Mr. Carrillo for coming from Kansas City. I think overall, as we've, as I've listened to this, and I, I think I've listened a lot, and, and, and in terms of the two concerns that, that citizens have, one is, should we consider racing? Should we continue racing? Is it viable? And it appears that most people want to continue racing, and Though we were told early on that racing was was weakening in the U.S. and that maybe it wasn't viable, what we're hearing as as the time has progressed is that there uh, that it is, and that there are a lot of options not only for racing but what people can do with parks. And so, in terms of that, um, this time has given us time, and and it sounds like you all know about about it as well. The other thing people are concerned about is money, and would a concern that we don't want to have to pay that 10 million bucks that we owe right now if we can avoid it out of property taxes or particularly if we don't have raising. But then I think there's a lot of integrity that you're hearing from this room and that we've heard elsewhere that if we were going to invest, we make sure we want to make sure there's not just somebody running it, but somebody who really can take it where we thought it should go and and where maybe places we hadn't imagined. And I really appreciate your coming today and talking, uh, giving us the details that you have. Um, one request, just as we wrap up, would be, I don't know if you're comfortable today in this big group or if you'd be comfortable otherwise, sharing with us even a little bit more about your development experience, the kinds you've talked in general about challenges that you've taken on and successes you've had. I think we all want to make sure, even though usually you don't uh, offer your wares to an entire city of people, um, if you could tell us a little bit more, I think it would be very helpful. Chris may have to cut me off if I say a little bit too much. Uh, you know, the, the one thing that, uh, that, that we see is that there's a lot of underutilized space out there. And uh, I will tell you that, it, that uh, the time that I've had with Chris is I can also see that he has taken a lot of underutilized space, uh, specifically in the city of Raytown, uh, Missouri, and made it utilize space again and brought tenants back and, um, you know, and, and, and actually attracted specific national donut chains to an area that they would have never been in before, um, in my opinion. I, you know, I, I, I moved to Kansas City from, uh, from Southeast Kansas uh, after uh, undergrad to go to law school. And, and I can tell you, I kind of spent some time in those areas and to really see what they look like. I mean, one example I believe Ms. Anderson had of White Lakes Mall is that you know what it looked like just it was unattractive to investors and unattractive to business people and you know i can tell you specific examples in raytown missouri you could probably go through a, a laundry list if 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 we wanted to but uh, of places that were not i mean they're still functional they're good structurally they they just they're not there and they're not attracting the businesses for some reason or another and now that now they are and uh you have that a little bit of that into you have I, 
you have quite a bit of that in, in, in Topeka, but you also have an area that's just undeveloped and underutilized. And so, you know, I can tell you from Chris's experience in, 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 in that area is that there is a lot that he's accomplished uh, to develop and redevelop and revitalize. I mean, that's really the key word is not, not just developing those areas, but revitalizing, revitalizing those areas and making them uh, beneficial, workable, and attracting attracting businesses and that's what you need um, in in Heartland Park is that you need businesses to come out there not only for the employees but also to generate the revenue to make that that yellow area that we've talked about more productive uh, and actually have it have it generate tax revenue other than just racing and so I think that you know those are those are areas in which you know from a development standpoint Chris has had a ton of success uh, over a short period of uh, or over a long period of time uh, and even more success recently um, in those areas and getting businesses to come into places that they, that they probably weren't that interested in beforehand and, uh, and becoming part of the community, becoming part of the operational status of that community and you know, employing local people and generating local dollars in, in these areas. And so you know, there's, there's a lot of that that can be done in Heartland Park uh, and, and I think that, that we were going to put, be able to put together the team between Mr. Moss and, and Chris and getting this area actually developed uh, from the development side. I hope I answered your question. Well, so if people didn't already Google him and check him out, if they wanted to check, is the thing to do to check for your name and Raytown in terms of looking at the more specifics <laughs> of what it was like and what you did? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I've never Googled Mr. Payne. I've never Googled <laughs> myself. Um, you know, we the, do that here. Yeah, no, that's, 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 good. that's a good that's a good start. But right. um, we'll let you escape we'll right. now. Thank you. Can I just say one more thing? Just a short footnote. Uh, I was the somebody mentioned. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> somebody mentioned that that would be a good place for the military to do training. I was the commander of the 4203rd Medical Logistics Detachment uh, at the reserve unit at Topeka and. Uh, the freeway down there, and it that property is excellent for that purposes. And we did do driver training, we did small unit training, we did map reading, we did all kinds of things, and we really appreciated the use of that property. And hope will hopefully I'm I, I'm not speaking for them now. I'm retired, but uh, I I'm sure they would really feel the loss of that property if they were not able to use it for those purposes for training. Thank you, sir. Councilmember De La Isla. The mayor has jokes. <laughs> no, um, on a serious note, I just want to say thank you to everybody. People on a constant basis talk about Topeka, Topeka, Topeka. The city of Topeka is only as strong as the citizens that are in here. And the fact that we have had such wonderful attendance to both events is wonderful. Second, I would like to say thank you for the people that had the comments in favor, but I would especially want to say thank you for the people that had the comments against. And the reason why is that the individuals that are speaking that are not in favor of, of what we're doing or how we're proceeding are allowing us the opportunity to understand what your concerns are so that we can better address them. You're polishing us, so thank you for all of your questions, for being here, for speaking your voice. Um, thank you to the, the staff and, and sincerely thank you for the council members and our mayor who has been spectacular. Mr. Payne, um, should you be the person and should everything work out, um, I look forward to working with you and seeing the great things that are gonna happen in this great community. Michelle, the comment that you just made, um, the city of Topeka is strong and people make the city strong, well it's sort of like which came first, the chicken or the egg do. What if the City of Topeka is weak. Then does that make the people weaker? Are you seeing what I'm saying? Which came first, chicken or the egg? I believe in our city and our people. All right. Thank thank you uh, for this. Now we're going to break up this formal part of the meeting, and we're going to hang around um, and have an opportunity to mingle. Thank you.